Good morning. Good morning, New Life Manitou. How are y'all this morning? Is everyone's getting their seats? Good, good. My name is Hayden Woods. I am the New Life Manitou intern here at New Life Manitou, and I'm so glad you all are here. I'm so pumped. Man, I just, the worship, it blew me away. I hope it blew y'all away. I just, the sense I got for this morning as we were worshiping is y'all were proclaiming out all, all of the insecurities, all the struggles, you were proclaiming it out this morning. Man, it is powerful, and I am so glad to see you all today. So if you guys will please stand for me as we read the scriptures this morning. Awesome. So this is 1 Samuel 24, 1 through 22. After Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, he was told, David is in the desert of En Gedi. So Saul took 3,000 able young men from all of Israel and set out to look for David and his men near the crags of wild goats. He came to the sheep pens along the way. A cave was there, and Saul went into relief himself. David and his men were far back in the cave, and the men said, This is the day of the Lord, spoke of when he said to you, I will give your enemy into your hands, and for you to deal with as you wish. Then David crept wait, yeah. Then David crept up unnoticed and cut off a corner of Saul's robe. Afterward, David was con- conscience stricken. Guys, I got like fifth grade reading, so give me a second. <laughs> For having cut off a corner of his robe, he said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lay my hand on him, for he is the anointed of the Lord. With these words, David sharply rebuked his men and did not allow them to attack Saul. And Saul left the cave and went on his way. Then David went out of the cave and called out to Saul, My Lord the king. When Saul looked behind him, David bowed down and portrayed, prostrated himself, goodness, with his face to the ground. He said to Saul, why do you listen when men say, David is bent on harming you? This day you have seen with your own eyes how the Lord delivered you into my hands in the cave. Some urged me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not lay down my hand on my Lord because he is the Lord's anointed. See, my father looked at this piece of your robe in my hand. I cut off the corner of your robe, but did not kill you. See, that there is nothing in my hand to indicate that I am guilty of wrongdoing or rebellion. I have not wronged you, but you are hunting me down to take my life. May the Lord judge between you and me, and may the Lord avenge the wrongs you have done to me. But my hand will not touch you. As the Lord, as the old saying goes, from evildoers comes evil deeds. So my hand will not touch you. Against whom has the king of Israel come out? Who are you pursuing? A dead dog? A flea? May the Lord be our judge and decide between us. May he consider my cause and uphold it. May he vindicate me by delivering me from your hand. When David finished saying this, Saul asked, is, is that your voice, David, my son? And he wept aloud. You are more righteous than I, he said. You have treated me well, but I have treated you badly. You have just told me about the good you did to me. The Lord delivered me into your hands, but you did not kill me. When a man finds his enemy, does he not let him get away unharmed? May the Lord reward you for the way you treated me today. I know that you will surely be king and that the kingdom of Israel will be established in your hands. Now swear to me by the Lord that you will not kill off my descendants or wipe out my name from my father's family. So David gave his oath to Saul. Then Saul returned home. But David and his men went up to the stronghold. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Hayden. Would you remain standing as we pray? Lord, we pray that our hearts would be as tender in this situation as David is, as David follows your words to do good, even though the one who is doing such evil is there with him. Lord, may we repay good even when evil comes to us, and may we trust in you 
with our hearts. We pray this in your name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and God's people shouted, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I have two points this morning, two hopes this morning for us in this sermon. The first point is that we would do good, that we would see in this situation that even though Saul is doing evil to David, David will do good, that we might have the courage to have a tender heart to do good even when evil comes our way. And the second point is to trust in the Lord. Two points this morning, do good and trust in the Lord. This passage is... is it's an interesting passage. Hayden got to the part where the guy relieved himself, and it's like, yeah, that's what this is about. This is a weird, this is, I look around, and it's, let's, let's be honest, it's a little awkward in here. Um, it reminds me of, I went on a mission trip, uh, my very first mission trip years ago when I was uh, in college. We went to Guatemala with Washington Heights Baptist Church in Ogden, Utah, which uh, my boy here over here, he went to uh, Weber State, which I did. So anyways, uh, in Utah, we, we had this trip. Guatemala, a, the church called for uh, a trip. Who wants to go? Some people showed up, uh, paid their deposit. It was the first meeting of all the people gathered, and the person from Guatemala, our missionary contact, came to talk to us gave us some, uh, like, just like, here's why we're going. The Lord is going to do some great things. Now, here's some practical advice. And the room got silent. It's like, what's it going to be? And he said, by the end of this trip, you all don't know each other now. And we looked around. You're, yeah, no one really knows anybody. It was a big enough church. And he said, by the end of this trip, you're going to be so comfortable with each other. You're going to be talking about the bathroom and going to poop together. And we looked around like, this is really awkward and I'm looking around and yes this is awkward in here but I hope that we've you know been a church for two years now and I, I could probably name 90% of you in here I think we're to the point now where we can talk if you're new in here Lord have mercy <laughs> well there's a, a children's book that says uh, the title is do you know this book is everyone poops <laughs> and uh and it's a book about different animals and all people. It's just, let's be professional in here. Let's look at scripture. Um, probably just talking to myself. I have four little boys, and so everything is, is poo-poo heads, poo-poo beds, poo-poo dance, poo-poo pants. And so forgive me as we continue. Let's get into the text, shall we? This, amen, thank you. Keep, keep me on track. Just look at me and be like, no, let's move on when, when we get there. Uh, First Samuel has been a series we've been in for quite a few weeks now. We are, I think, going to conclude it today because next week is Palm Sunday, and I really want to talk about uh, Holy Week and the passion of Jesus. And then the week after that, uh, as Sarah mentioned, is Easter. We're just two weeks away. And so we're concluding this series today. And if we look back, First Samuel starts off talking about who? Samuel. Yeah, it's not a trick question. Samuel, this little boy, the Lord calls him. He's given a, a word and the Lord speaks to him and then he goes and listens to the Lord, becomes a prophet. Uh, the people want a king. He, Samuel, anoints a king, the very first king of Israel. Another guy starts with an S. Do you remember? Saul, and he ends up, for a very quick minute, ends up being a good guy and uniting the tribes uh, of Israel, and then descends on this escalator to more and more and more evil. He turns against the Lord. He lies. He wants to murder God's anointed David. He descends, and we're going to see it in this passage as well. He descends to a very low place. He walks away from God again and again and again and again. And he ends up being a very bad person who wants to kill David. He's so jealous of David. If you know the story, David and Goliath, David kills Goliath. A song is written, says Saul has killed his thousands. David has killed his tens of thousands. Saul has killed his thousands. David has killed his tens of thousands. And the song goes out and Saul gets so jealous. He wants to kill David in the privacy of his palace. There's a spear at him to kill him. David alludes another time spear at a dinner table, another spear incident. Saul wants David dead. Here we find in the story, catching up to where we are today, 3,000 men. Think about that number for just a minute. What it would take to keep 3,000 men alive running around in the wilderness for days upon days looking for one guy, 
David, who Saul thinks is public enemy number one. And here is the incident. Let's look at it in the text, uh, chapter 24, verse 1. Uh, let's see, let me read it. After Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, he was told David is in the desert of An Gedi. So Saul took 3,000 able young men from all of Israel. He set out to look for David near the crags of the wild goats. We've all been there, haven't we? Um, <laughs> be a really good name for a band though don't you think or a coffee shop um Saul, he continue, came to uh, sheep pens along the way, I guess there was some farms or something, and a cave was there, and Saul went in to relieve himself. And awkwardly enough, David and his men were in the far back of the cave. So just, this is a weird passage of scripture. Um, Saul here reminds, I grew up in my teenage years watching Seinfeld. Saul reminds me of Costanza, always needing a special place to go to the bathroom. Here Saul finds himself in a cave near the crags of the wild goats. And this is just an interesting, awkward situation. He's in there, he's going to the bathroom, and little does he know is that David and his men, we don't know how many, but there could be hundreds of men in this cave. Uh, we don't, just think about the awkward situation, and we'll, we'll just move right along. But caving is something that's special to me. Some of you know that I am a caver. Uh, I, I'm, I'm like certified in caving. I take people cave. I took some people caving yesterday, John and Heather, and, and uh, where's Rachel, wherever. So I go caving, and cavers, uh, there's the leave no trace thing. Like, you know, in Colorado, I think everyone knows this. You don't throw litter out the window. You know, we're, we're better than that, right? We're not monsters. You leave no trace. Cavers take it to another level, and they really, the cave environment is pristine. You never, you just don't do stuff in caves that you're not supposed to do. You leave no trace. And so if there's any reason to really dislike Saul, this is yet <laughs> another reason to really dislike this is a bad dude just thinking of himself out to kill David with three th I mean think about the mental state of this man he's got 3,000 of his uh, warriors and people risking their life and running around missing their homes and their families just to kill David and here David is given an opportunity Saul is in the cave vulnerable as he is David and his men and the men say this verse 4 the men said this is the day the Lord spoke of when he said to you I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish so here's I mean David is out running from this man who's trying to kill him. The men are saying what everyone's thinking. This is our chance. Let's kill him. Let's be done with this thing. Let's all go home. Let's, let's end this right here, right now, David. Here's your opportunity. It's, it ends up being bad advice that his friends give them, which is sometimes the case. Our friends around us, we have to listen to the Lord ourselves, and we have to know what is right and what is wrong. Our friends, our, our counselors can be good, but we need to listen ourselves. And David listens to the Lord, and this is not the time to take. This is not the time to bend. This is not the time to kill and to murder someone. And so what does David do? Point number one, this, this has all been my uh, introduction. Point number one is this, it's quite simply just to repay good. Point number one is to repay good. Even in the midst of someone giving you evil, we repay good. Isn't this what Jesus teaches to love our enemies? And so what does David do? Uh, what will happen? Saul is vulnerable. David and his men are in the back. The men give him bad advice to so just end it right now, kill him. Instead, verse 4 says, David crept up unnoticed and cut off a corner of Saul's robe. And let's hope that Saul had taken off the robe and set it aside or else the story gets even more awkward. But David bends down, he cuts off and he gets a, a piece of, of Saul's robe. And why does he do that? Why doesn't he kill Saul? Well, David will say, he says, because he is the Lord's anointed. He is in authority. He is the king. Although David has been anointed king and Saul actually is the king, well, it's this interesting thing where David, we'll get to this next point in a minute, where David trusts the Lord so much, David trusts the Lord's timing, that he will not murder Saul, that he will not take this opportunity. He is doing, he's repaying good, even though Saul is repaying David evil, for David really doing nothing. And then, as the story continues, David has this cloth of Saul's robe. Saul goes out of the cave. I guess the, the 3,000 men were out there waiting. And then a very awkward scene where 
David comes out of the cave too. Imagine Saul's surprise when David comes out of the cave as well. And listen to what he says. Then David went out of the cave, called to Saul, my lord the king. Shows him respect. When Saul looked behind him, David bowed down, prostrated himself with his face on the ground. He said to Saul, why do you listen when men say David is bent on harming you? This day you've seen with your own eyes how the Lord delivered you into my hands. Some urged me to kill you, but I spared you. Uh, I said, I will not lay my hand on my Lord, that's the little L, on you, Saul, because he is the Lord's, Yahweh's anointed. See, my father, look at this piece of robe in my hand. I cut off the corner of your robe, but did not kill you. See that there is nothing in my hand to indicate that I'm guilty of wrongdoing or rebellion. You have not, I have not wronged you, but you are hunting me down to take my life. May the Lord judge. He says this, he's going to say this twice. He calls upon the Lord. May the Lord be the judge between you and me, and may the Lord avenge the wrongs that you've done to be. But my hand will not touch you, as the old saying goes, from evildoers comes evil deeds, so my hand will not touch you. David continues, against whom has the king of Israel come out? Who are you pursuing? He's referring to himself very humbly, a dead dog, a flea. May the Lord be our judge. This is the second time. The Lord be our judge and decide between us. May he consider my cause and uphold it. May he vindicate me by delivering me from your hand. Now think about this scene and how would you, how would Saul respond? Um, David comes out of the cave, presents the robe. I could have just killed you, but I didn't. May the Lord judge us. May the Lord judge. May the Lord be the judge. He says this twice. What does Saul do? Well, he responds maybe better than David could have thought. Saul responds. When David finished saying this, Saul asks, is that, my vo- is that your voice, my son, David? And he wept aloud. This goes really well in David's favor. Not only does he do the right thing, he, he does not take in his own hands murder and to, to revenge and vengeance. He does the right thing, and B, he, this ends up working out really well. Have you ever been in an argument with someone where they're like viciously attacking you personally, and like you, you, and you have the wherewithal, the courage to stand back and just to speak love and to speak kindness, to love your enemies? Well, usually, I've been in a few situations, usually this actually goes really well. Like, this isn't just what we're supposed to do. It's actually what ends up working out in favor of us and in favor of what the Lord is going to do. And it's, it's this that, you know, I think everyone fails us. And we'll get back to this point in a minute. Saul ends up failing David. David Saul is the king. David is uh, a part of the kingdom. And Saul, this leader, is going to fail David. He's going to fail the whole kingdom, really. Leaders will fail, but what will we do when we're, uh, uh, I guess, in confrontation with them? Will we do something? David does something. And David doesn't take matters into his own hand, but David presents his case and makes quite the statement. This will be a very short-lived. Here Saul is weeping and understanding what's going on, kind of repenting. But this will actually be very short-lived. This very same situation will happen in just a couple pages from here. David will be uh, being once again pursued by Saul. Do you know this? And Saul will be asleep. David will come up to him. David has the opportunity to kill him. Uh, Instead, David takes his spear and the water jug, gets to a safe place far away, then holds up these things. It's like the same exact story once again. This is very interesting. In fact, it led to uh, an awkward moment a couple, uh, I think it was like a a month and a half ago. My son Jay, he's uh, seven. We read every morning before the bus stop. We read about 15 or 20 minutes. He actually reads uh, of this children's Bible. It's a big children's Bible, like 400 pages. Uh, My grandmother Moore gave it to me when I was a little boy. So we're reading this, and we came to this part uh, that that he really liked about Saul going to the bathroom in a cave. He thought that was really funny. Uh, Yeah, it's funny, I guess. And then then, uh, David cutting off the robe and then the picture at the bottom wasn't right because the the children's picture artists they don't want to paint a picture of a guy going to the bathroom right so instead they combined these two stories and it was it was Saul sleeping and David cutting off the robe and my son Jay was just very confused did Saul go to the bathroom laying down no 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 it's this way there's two stories that the author the the artist forget the whole thing let's move on let's keep reading um 
So anyways, this is a very short list. So Saul is just, I really want to get across, Saul is a bad dude. And he, if, if anyone in the Bible is a, is a bad guy, Saul would surely be in that list of really bad guys. He is doing evil. He is doing wrong to David. And David does not take things into his own hands. Why? Well, point number two, David really trusts in the Lord. And that's a call to all of us to trust in the Lord. Do we trust in the Lord like David trusts? Now, this passage, this situation is really about vengeance and revenge. But I think we could, we could make it be about, you know, anytime we need to trust God for something and not to take things in our own hand and manipulate and twist and run with our own will, but trust in the Lord. This situation is about justice. There's something very deep in the human soul about wanting justice. When we see something not right, it just should be right. That shouldn't be, you know, it should be fair. Things should be right. I have four little boys. And uh, the other day uh, we were in Minnesota on vacation. I was pouring them uh, Cheerios, poured them four bowls, four Cheerio things. And one of the boys looks at the bowls and says, it's not fair. He has more than me. And this kind of thing happens on a daily, hourly basis. Somehow they're not able to count to 10. But then when it comes to like hundreds of Cheerios, <laughs> they're able to like, inspect like the, the, he has more why why would you do this and i i, I andrew Arndt was saying this is i always want to say uh you know why i did that because i love him more than i love you but you, you don't say this so you, you take the cheerio and you break it into fours okay now you all have the same amount right yes so here's an injustice getting to the text Getting back on track, I'm talking to myself. Uh, Saul is evil, just plain evil to David. David's done nothing here. David was anointed. He was out uh, with his sheep. Samuel shows up, anoints him king. He goes into battle on behalf of the, the, the tribe, the Israel. And he kills Goliath and he wins the battle. David's really done nothing here. David is now in Saul's eyes, public enemy number one. And here's an opportunity in this cave for David to take things into his own hands or trust in the Lord. And we know that David trusts in the Lord. There's something called, um, maybe you've heard of it uh, in the business world, uh, the fraud triangle. Like why does someone commit fraud? There's three points of this fraud triangle. Like why, do, why does someone steal from a company or, or do, do some sort of fraud in the business world? And it's uh, at, the, at the top is um, there's pressure in someone's life, like they need money. There's a rationalization that the person can, can go through. It's, oh, well, this company's so big. You know, they, they don't think they'll know that, you know, if I steal a few hundred dollars. So there's a rationalization. There's there's something that, that is a pressed need in the person's life. And then the fourth point is an opportunity. Like an opportunity presents itself. And Lord, help us. Help us all when opportunities are presented. We're not planning these things, but an opportunity is presented for us to twist, for us to lie, for an affair to happen. An opportunity comes about for that we're not looking for, but it just comes our way. Here is an opportunity presented. How could David ever have known that the cave he would be in would be the one that Saul comes in alone, apart from his 3,000 men? Here's an opportunity for David to take things into his own hands or trust in the Lord and David trusts. Here's the main point of this sermon about this trusting in the Lord is that David really trusts in what God is doing, the position of leadership. He trusts that God has anointed Saul. Saul has fallen very, very far from that anointing. And David's been anointed king. So really, and I, I imagine in David's mind, it's probably just a matter of time until he becomes king and he could take things into his hands or he could trust in the Lord. And again and again and again, we see David trusting in the Lord, trusting in the Lord's timing, trusting in how the Lord would want this to be done. There's a, a beautiful book. It's, it's, a, it's a, like a biblical, historical, fictional book about uh, the scenes like this. It's uh, by Gene Edwards called A Tale of Three Kings. Have you read that book? Amen, sister. Uh, it's a 100-page read. You should all get it and read it. It's about church leadership. It's about leadership 
principles in general. It's about uh, David and what he must have been going through. And he just came, he was a nobody from nowhere, a shepherd boy. He gets risen to power. It should have been the best day of his life when Samuel showed up and anointed him king. But instead, it leads to probably 10 to 15 years of horrible, like hell on earth, like someone chasing him day after day, trying to kill him. Many of the Psalms that David writes are about these times. It's like, Lord, have mercy on me. Kill. My enemies are after me. They're always haunting me. They're always torturing me. Lord, help. I need your hand. And so David goes out and with this robe, piece of robe in his hand, and he confronts King Saul. He, notice he doesn't do uh, nothing. He does something. He goes out. He presents himself, which, which took a lot of courage. Anyway, so there's out there's 3,000 men ready to kill him. He could have just hidden the cave and stayed there, but instead he goes out in full view and makes a speech. And he says, may the Lord be our judge. This is verse 15. And decide between us. May he consider my cause and uphold it. May he vindicate me by delivering me from your hand. Think about the boldness here, David is saying. Like, may the Lord be our judge. You have done, he, he tells it like it is. He's not, he's not being a, a, a mouse here. He's being with courage confronting King Saul. It says, you have done me wrong, but may the Lord be our judge. The image of the Lord being our judge is often uh, uh, one that we shy away from. That's one that uh, maybe even at times you as a Christian have been embarrassed of. Like, oh yeah, the Lord judges and he is loving and it's hard to put these two together. But can I tell you something? The, the Lord judging is a very good thing because the Lord is good and he will make all things right. And it's something we really, as human beings, it's something we long for, for the Lord to make all things right. The creed that we say together sometimes here uh, at New Life, uh, this is the creed we believe in, the Nicene Creed, has this very... Um, very important line, very hopeful line. It's, uh, it's about Jesus, how he has come. He's, he's come for our forgiveness. He's died. He's risen from the grave. He's ascended into heaven, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. This is the ultimate trust that we need to have in Jesus, that he will make all things right, that people will fail us, that situations will fail us, but in the end, he will return and he will make all things right. Throughout the week, I think about this service a lot. I think it's probably the most important thing we do as, as families. We gather together and we worship the Lord. We gather here in this place. And I spend a lot of time thinking about it. And I, I often think about the sinner. Like, what's the sinner of this service? What's the most important thing in this service? And I could tell you, it's, it's, not, the, it's not the sermon. It's not, the sermon sh shouldn't be the, the center because then some person speaking would be the sinner. And people that we, we all fail. We'll, we'll fail. We'll say the wrong thing at some point. We'll, it just, it's, it's not the center. The, the songs that we sing, that's beautiful, but it's not the center. The songs that we sing are written by people that can fail and the singers can, uh, the, the instruments, uh, whatever. It's not, but what can't fail is Jesus. This is why the cross is the centerpiece of our room. This is why there's a table at the center of our room with the Lord. So we celebrate the body and the blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus as we consider the table and what's really central, you know, I think sometimes um, churches, and maybe I'm, I'm guilty of this too, of like always, you know, like, oh, new people are coming in and maybe you're new today. And, and some churches are, we call them seeker sensitive, seeker friendly, uh, or seeker centered churches that just want, you know, so want to make sure that the experience of someone checking out the church is like they become, the, this new person becomes the center. It's like, oh, it's all about them. We want to make sure you're good and you're comfortable. And those things are all good. They're all great. But center to this service, center to every service really should be Jesus and him, him crucified, the cross and this table that is up here. So in a minute, we're going to take communion we're going to partake of the body, of the blood of our Lord. And this is what's central. Do we trust in the Lord so much so that we would never take things into our own hands? We would give our salvation to the Lord. We would give our sins over to the Lord and say, Lord, would you take these things from me? Would we give even our death to the Lord? The Lord, you are in charge. The song we sang uh, that, that we have risen from, that he has risen and we will rise to, the grave won't hold us. 
Would you stand with me? Would you pray, bow your heads with me? The band, you can come up. Let's just take a minute to quiet ourselves, to listen, to celebrate that the Lord is central, that the Lord will never fail us, that we can trust in him, that we can do that he, what he taught to repay good, to do his things and his ways on this earth. So Lord, we pray to you right now and we thank you that you have never failed and you will never fail us. Though things look differently than maybe we wanted them to look, Lord, you've always been there and you will never fail us. Though people fail, those situations fail, Lord, you will never fail. And as we prepare our hearts to come forward, to, to gaze upon the cross and to remember you, to take bread, to take from the cup, to receive these things, Lord, we pray your spirit in us. Awaken us, Lord. Aliven us to your things, we pray, Lord.